Um, so uh, my name is uh, Ben Michael. I'm a senior clinician scientist fellow and a neurologist. Uh, and I will be chairing today uh, in uh, Tom Solomon's absence. I'm delighted to be joined on the panel by uh, Professor Bart Jacobs, uh, who's a professor in neurology and immunology and a consultant neurologist. And he actually chairs the steering committee of the International Gillian Barry Outcome Study. Uh, he's based in the Department of Neurology and Immunology at Erasmus University Medical Center in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. And I'm delighted we're also joined by Professor Bart's uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Sonia Leonard, uh, who's also based in the Department of Neurology at Erasmus uh, in Rotterdam and has training as a clinical microbiologist and having led several projects on Guillain-Barre syndrome in relation to Zika virus and other arboviruses. And she's also been involved uh, in IGOS as well. And she's also studied outbreaks of infectious diseases in relation to Guillain-Barre uh, syndrome, uh, including the Peruvian outbreak of uh, Campylobacter and the, during this SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Uh, so delighted that they could join us, uh, bringing with them, of course, a wealth of expertise uh, in Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, we've two speakers today um, uh, who I'll introduce, and we've also got our JNNP blog as usual. Just before we get started, I've been asked to share with you just a few slides before we get to the speakers. So as I say, I'm uh, Ben Michael, Senior Clinician Scientist Fellow and Neurologist, um, and I spent my time uh, leading the um, Infection Neuroscience Lab uh, in uh, Liverpool and where I am currently now, uh, back at Harvard Medical School in, in Boston. Um, just to uh, highlight some of the resources that are available through uh, the Brain Infections Global uh, team and hosted by our partners at the Global Health Network. Uh, if you go to, to our website, you'll see uh, there's uh, access to all the previous webinars and lots of uh, online learning e-resources uh, and also the capacity to submit uh, vaccine adverse events. Um, two other uh, events that uh, may be of interest to this audience. Uh, the first is the encephalitis conference, uh, which really is now the, the international go-to uh, encephalitis conference uh, in the world, and it'll be hybrid uh, for those of you that would like to join digitally. Uh, and that's on the 7th of December with uh, presentations from uh, Professor Jerome Honorat from France, uh, Professor Kieran Thacker from the US, and uh, Professor Deanna Saylor, who splits her time between uh, Johns Hopkins in the USA and University Teaching Hospital in Lusaka, Zambia, uh, who bring really great perspectives on uh, encephalitis across these uh, high, uh, low and middle income settings. And also new for this year, uh, on the day before the conference, on Monday the 6th, uh, there'll be a couple of free events uh, one is a, uh, an interactive uh, discussion and workshop around how to get your fellowship or your grant. Uh, and I will be presenting along with uh, Omar Siddiqui from, uh, from Boston also. Uh, and there'll be a research exchange meeting as well for those of you that have been invited to present at that. Uh, and then the last of the, of the plugs that I have to give um, really is, um, so this is the, the, the webinar of the Brain Infections uh, Global uh, Group. Uh, so it's a, it's a presentation of, of pretty polished work and an opportunity to uh, have some discussion afterwards. Um, but se separate from that, for the WHO, um, I help lead the uh, clinical exchange platform where we meet monthly uh, with doctors uh, and allied health professionals from high, low and middle income settings uh, discussing uh, the management of predominantly neurological infection, uh, but we're also expanding to, to more uh, integration between uh, clinical work and, uh, and research. And it's an absolute pleasure to have at our next presentation, which will be on the uh, 30th of November uh, at two o'clock uh, London time, uh, Dr. Jim Sedgvar from uh, the CDC in the US, who will be able to talk about recent outbreaks uh, and also more broadly about how do doctors work in public health in solving medical mysteries when there are outbreaks uh, of infectious diseases which affect the nervous system. Uh, and his uh, talk was in, entitled Seizures in the Field, Using Public Health to Address Neurological Illness. So uh, if you would like to learn more about what we do, do uh, join us, uh, our community of about 19,000 visitors and 1,800 members can be joined from that website. It's, it's a global group. Um, and uh, so beyond those resources, the purpose of, of what we're doing now is really to bring together the global community working on neurological complications of COVID-19 to better understand how they, they present, the spectrum of these complications, uh, and perhaps some insights into disease mechanisms also. And this is a way to keep up to date with the latest research. And we often present uh, 
work at these webinars that is either uh, you know in preprint or under consideration and um, so really we try and keep things as up to date as possible and both this webinar and uh, my WHO clinical exchange platform, uh, we did a survey. So thanks to uh, the, the many hundreds of you that completed the survey. Uh, thanks for your feedback, which we are now implementing. Um, and uh, congratulations to Dr. Ernest uh, from Nigeria, uh, who was uh, selected uh, as the winner of the prize of our respondents and our book uh, on neurological infections that we wrote uh, it, it is on its way to you. So um, just in terms of etiquette, um, please do post your questions and comments in the chat. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, you also you can, you know, tweet at me and uh, stuff if you want to. I'm, I'm at Benedict Nero. Um, but for the purpose of this, we'll try and keep the, the comments and questions within the chat. Um, so uh, here we are. Um, so uh, I will introduce our first speaker. I'll stop sharing and give her a chance to uh, start to share her screen. So we are joined uh, today uh, by Dr. Mega Dame, uh, who did her residency in the US in neurology at Baylor in Texas, after completing med medical school in India. After her residency, she pursued a fellowship in neuromuscular medicine from Cleveland in the US. And then she returned back to India after this fellowship and currently practices as a neuromuscular neurologist in Mumbai. And her area of interest is myasthenia gravis, and other immune mediated uh, neuropathies and neuromyopathies. So uh, without further ado, uh, thanks very much for being with us, Dr. Megna. I will uh, hand to you now, thank you. Thank you so much for Dr. Dr. Michael for the kind uh, introduction. Let me share your screen. I, and I thank you all for the invitation as well for this uh, in this uh, interesting session. So um, today, uh, I will be presenting on neurological associations of COVID-19, uh, GBS following COVID-19. This was a, a study that we did um, in the state of Maharashtra. It's a, it's a state in India. And I will be presenting about this study here. <clears throat> so when you Google, this was the time when I was first preparing for the talk 2020 when, I, when the study was published. You know, a lot of articles uh, are being published in PubMed, and that's uh, because of the neurological associations in COVID-19, which we subsequently came to know, because they play an important role in aggravating the disease severity and the mortality. And as rightly said, we need to understand the neuropathogenesis, the cellular mechanisms underlying the neurological manifestations of COVID-19. Potential routes of sars coronavirus 2 invasion have been um, investigated, um, as uh, mentioned. We also know about the ACE2 receptors, uh, which are expressed in multiple regions of the brain. So mechanisms of neuronal injury could be either viral neurotropism, abnormal immune response, and cytokine overproduction and thrombosis. Coming to the peripheral nervous system and COVID-19, um, it has affected, uh, it, it does affect neuropathies, mononeuropathies, cranial neuropathies, uh, myalgias, myopathies, even necrotizing myositis has been reported. So this was a typical case. This was in the early stage of the pandemic. Uh, this patient was admitted to our hospital, 56 years old gentleman. He had a history of hypertension. His initial symptoms were diplopia. He had difficulty walking, imbalance, which progressed rapidly to paraparesis and uh, uh, involving the upper extremity as well. And he was diagnosed clinically as uh, GBS. He did not have a preceding history of fever, cough, diarrhea, or illness. But because of the ongoing pandemic, a nasopharyngeal swap for uh, uh, coronavirus uh, by RT-PCR was done and it was positive. So he was in the COVID ICU, he was isolated of conduction study. CSF was consistent with GBS. He was treated with IVIG. His course was unremarkable until the first week of uh, admission. By day 10, we were planning to transfer him out of ICU. And that is when he desaturated to 86, 88%. His inflammatory markers went high, CRP, uh, D-dimer, uh, he required high-flow nasal oxygen, 
uh, IV methyl prednisolone. So he, chest, HRCT chest was consistent with COVID pneumonia. And we had to give him tocilizumab. After which, within 24 hours, uh, his clinical course uh, rapidly improved and he was transferred out of the ICU, discharged a week later. So what was the points to ponder in this patient? Because he did not have initial preceding illness. GBS was the initial symptom and uh, coronavirus infection was incidentally detected by a routine testing. So this was um, what was important that um, to test for these uh, for the infection in patients who were asymptomatic for coronavirus too. This was during the early part, early stage of the pandemic. Now we know that GBS has been associated with coronavirus too. But so this was the questions that we all had. And, uh, uh, you know, was GBS due to coronavirus infection? Is it different than the typical post-infectious GBS that we see? or which was seen in the previous pandemics, can inflammatory markers guide us to monitor these patients? Is there a role of convalescent plasma? Could early COVID-19 treatment influence the outcome? Because the overall outcome is a different than the, um, the typical GBS. So um, GBS, as we know, is an acute polyradiculopathy. It's uh, provoked by an aberrant immune response. And it is a molecular mimicry where uh, in Aman and Emsan, the antiganglioside antibodies are seen. Uh, the first case of GBS was reported in Wuhan. It was a similar presentation to the patient that we had. A para-infectious profile is what is being discussed about, which was also seen in the Zika virus pandemic. Okay, so... Uh, the, the, at the time of uh, our uh, presentations, we, we did have these many case series, uh, individual case reports, uh, meta-analysis talking about GBS and COVID-19 from Italy, US, uh, Wuhan. And uh, the, the, the largest series was a meta-analysis from um, uh, Abu Rumeli, um, which, was, which talked about a systematic review of 73 cases worldwide. Now, what we saw is, this was a, it's the state of Maharashtra in India, and I, I practice here in Mumbai. Maximum cases were from Mumbai. We had 42 cases just from uh, the state of Maharashtra, and uh, we did have a lot more which did not participate. So if we could have included those, it would have been around 60, 70 just from the state of Maharashtra as compared to 72 worldwide, which were reported. However, we had 15 participating centers, 20, 25 cases were from Mumbai, few from Pune and Akola. So this was a representation that we had. It was a multi-centric study, retrospective and observational study. Um, we included all cases with GBS uh, diagnosed by the treating neurologist who had a SARS coronavirus 2 infection. A clinical diagnosis was accepted because of the pandemic situation or in some cases who could not afford um, uh, the investigations. Uh, SARS coronavirus 2 infection was identified by a positive RT-PCR or COVID-19 antibody status. GBS mimics and patients without coronavirus 2 infection were ruled out. Uh, so we had 42 patients, 31 uh, for male and so predominant males and elderly age group uh, was a typical demographic profile, which was discussed in the previous studies, as well as, um, uh, as we know from the typical GBS that we see, otherwise it's elderly males. So it, this was consistent with the, the typical GBS. Now uh, we studied the interval between COVID-19 and GBS and um, Maximum patients, uh, they were between seven days or between the first two weeks of uh, the infection and COVID-19 GBS. So the median time interval between the onset of uh, SARS coronavirus 2 and GBS was 14 days, as reported with the other studies um, and, and the systemic meta-analysis at the time of presentation of the study. Uh, what was interesting was 26 patients had a para-infectious presentation and 16 were post-infectious as against a typical GBS, which is classically described as a post-infectious GBS. 
the neurological presentations commonly uh, patients had a ge generalized weakness five of those who had generalized weakness um, had uh, been admitted for COVID-19, were in ICU and had difficulty weaning off from the ventilator and uh, they were tested uh, by nerve conduction studies and CSF studies and diagnosed as having GBS. Lower extremity weakness was present in 31. Only one patient had upper extremity weakness with facial weakness. Um, I mean, isolated facial weakness with upper extremity. Um, Miller Fisher GBS overlap syndrome was seen in three patients. Antibody testing was cannulocyte antibody testing was done in only one patient, and uh, it was negative. Uh, the predominant subtype based on nerve conduction study was demyelinating in uh, 25 out of uh, a total of 39 that we tested. <clears throat> they were treated, most of them were treated with IVIG. Um, as you can see, the only nine deaths were reported in the study. The outcome was good in majority of the cases. Uh, plasma pheresis was given to one patient. Um, one patient received IV methylprednisolone uh, for the treatment of COVID-19 pneumonia, um, but he improved um, his GBS uh, symptoms. Neurological symptoms were mild and uh, it was decided not to uh, give him IVIG because he had improved. Um, there was no treatment given to nine patients, mainly because of financial constraints. And uh, the other reason was that uh, they had paraparesis, but it was not a disabling GBS and they had improved. Uh, so the functional status at discharge, if you look at the graph, a uh, majority of them did improve. 44% uh, were walking independently at discharge and 16% uh, were bed bound and 16% required moderate support while walking. Some observations that we saw in our study, uh, GBS was the initial presenting symptom in 14 out of 42 patients we had. 16 of them uh, remain asymptomatic for COVID-19 they were detected because of the incidental testing uh, for COVID-19. Outcomes were better in the post-infectious group. Uh, I mean, this can be explained because uh, the para-infectious group also had uh, inflammatory markers, a severe COVID pneumonia. So the underlying severity of the COVID-19 disease determined the outcome in those patients, basically. Um, is there a role of convalescent plasma in GBS and COVID-19? This has been discussed. And uh, the recent, uh, basically because of the cytokine storm and, uh, uh, you know, uh, favorable uh, anti-inflammatory profile that, that is there in GBS as well as the, the COVID-19. Uh, but however, the, the, the recent study that we know, uh, the randomized controlled trial, of convalescent plasma in COVID-19 did not show benefit in clinical outcomes, but I think this needs to be uh, evaluated. So getting back to the question that uh, you know we had, uh, is GBS due to sars coronavirus 2 infection? Is it associated or is it because of the virus? Is it really related to it? So, uh, and is it different from the typical post-infectious GBS? Um, There's a very nice paper by uh, Dalakas, which describes the, 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 the autoimmune mechanisms that possibly could lead to an association between GBS and COVID-19, uh, talking about neurotropism, improvement with IVIG, um, some rare cases which did have antiganglioside antibodies uh, present, triggering a classical post-viral immune response. And... Uh, uh, versus a para-infectious GBS, which could be because of a dysregulated or a hyperimmune system uh, at the initial stage of the, the, the disease presentation. Also, we need to remember to rule out GBS mimics while treating patients with COVID-19. Um, and then after publication of our study, uh, just before, uh, I think just before uh, we published, there was this very interesting paper from UK, uh, uh, group, uh, Keddie's group, which talks about uh, epidemiological and cohort study, which finds no association between COVID-19 and GBS. Um, 
and uh, however i still i i do feel that there is an association because overall the cases of gbs were less uh, but however uh, these cases were associated with gbs uh, with covid 19 and how how would you explain the presentation as an initial presentation of gbs uh, an incidental report of covid-19 in those patients or a para infectious profile uh, that we see in association with the covid-19 so i still feel that we need larger studies to establish uh, the association and read about the pathogenesis of covid-19 talking about vaccines and gbs we do have a presentation following this but the latest paper um study the the rate of recurrent of gbs after covid-19 vaccine i think i will leave this discussion for the next speaker so the take home message from my talk is patients presenting with gbs or a neurological disease i think should be screened for sars coronavirus 2 in the setting of the ongoing pandemic gbs associated with covid-19 is not different than the typical gbs the severity of the underlying covid-19 determines the outcome in these patients we do need to do a prospective data we need ongoing studies and worldwide registry so that we can learn more about this disease thank you great super thank you thank you very much i will clap on behalf of our silent audience thank you for your presentation if i could ask perhaps the uh, my colleagues on the panel to um put their cameras on and unmute uh and i will uh, hand to to professor jacobs and uh, dr leonard if they would like to uh, ask any questions of our first speaker thank and you for the audience please do post your questions in the chat thank you thank you um so yes yeah, it's okay that i ask the first question that would be great thank you okay Um first of all um uh thank you for this presentation uh, uh Dr. Dama I think it looks very interesting and well done congratulations with this uh, uh interesting study um I I noticed that in your uh presentation you indicated that uh 31% of your cohort had uh lower extremities uh involvement and is that considered to be a kind of paraparetic variant of the Guillain-Barré syndrome and my second question is did you have evidence for um uh, involvement of the arms for instance in nerve conduction studies or do you think there is still a possibility that this may be another disease let's say more on the myelin level yeah uh, yeah good question so i i these patients did have evidence of gbs uh in the nerve conduction studies now uh uh they the presentation the earlier presentation was paraparetic but there were few patients who did develop a generalized weakness later on involving the upper extremities which could have been milder but i think uh now this was a retrospective study and there was limitations because we had 15 participating centers as well so uh the data uh that we had um was the initial presentation of the illness and i think uh, i can go back and see how many patients uh, evolved into generalized weakness later uh, to see how many really were paraparetic versus those uh, uh, you know who who evolved into a, a generalized weakness that's that's a good point yeah so, so in 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 the netherlands in europe where where i am living Uh, we have investigated uh, this paraparetic variant uh, as well and i think it really exists but it is only let's say 15% of all the patients so in your country it's considerably higher and i would like to compare uh, those data so so you need to be of course absolutely sure that this is guillain-barre syndrome and not for instance mm. uh, transverse myelitis which may also be triggered by by covid um, and i would be interested to to, to talk with you on this uh, this later but i will send you our report sure thank yes, you dr lenny if i can also ask a question or oh. yeah so uh, congratulations um really nice presentation um i'm interested in in your your thoughts and also your definition of para infectious uh, killenberry syndrome because this is something that's 
it's often um, discussed. Also, you mentioned the Zika virus epidemic. Uh, that was also, there were cases that were deemed to be parapoetic and then cases post, post infectious, or sorry, not para, um, para infectious and mm -hmm. those that were post infectious. So how, how did you define in your cohort um, para infectious disease? Yeah, this is where we had the major difficulty in uh, differentiating the patients between para and uh, post-infectious. Uh, so patients who presented in the uh, first two weeks, uh, it was not just temporal association, but those who had high inflammatory markers, HRCT uh, showing an active pneumonia at that time, those were taken as para-infectious. Those patients who had recovered from COVID-19 pneumonia or fever and presented with uh, GBS uh, uh, after two weeks uh, were considered as post-infectious. We tried to uh, categorize it as much as possible because we did have this overlap. Some of those patients did have an, an overlap. But the main thing that, uh, you know, th those patients who had an active COVID infectious disease was very clear cut in those patients that we could uh, uh, take them as a para infectious group is what, um, what, what we did. Right. Yeah, and and what, I, what... I agree there was a, there was a difficulty in um, categorizing. And I, 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 I mean, I, I think it's a spectrum. I don't know if we can really, uh, uh, differentiate them into para and post infectious when we see them in, in practice. Do you yeah, have any thoughts on course. that? Well, I think one of the things that I'm wondering about is um, uh, the presumed difference in the pathology because I think you want to make these different categories because you think that there's a difference in the underlying pathology, right, between the para infectious patients and those that are post infectious. And I wonder what that could be because. Um, of course, you can have you 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 can theorize about the, the the possibility of a direct infection of the of the SARS-CoV virus, mm. but there I think there is little evidence at, at this point in the literature because most um, you know patients do not or I think almost none have um, PCR uh, detected in CSF or no you know no cells in CSF. Um, uh, so that doesn't seem to be very, very uh, plausible. Um, yeah. So then you have an immu immune related disease, both in the para infectious and in the post infectious cases. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder what exactly the difference would be in your view um, in this sort of immunological um, response, what, what makes the difference between para and post infectious. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts? Um... So the, so the papers which I read and as well as the studies, basically, they have been talking about uh, this interesting paper by Dalekas also mentions about the, uh, you know, the only the hyperimmune response that we are seeing. Could, could that be the, the reason for the para-infectious um, presentation of GBS? So that, that was one uh, discussed. Um, so this, this is what, uh, you know, I wonder if that is the cause of the para-infectious uh, presentation of GBS. Right. And the post-infectious could be an antibody mediated. Uh, I mean, uh, an autoimmune trigger basically. I mean, a molecular mimicry that we know in the typical post-infectious. So, so that's why, you know, we, probably we need more studies on this and, you know, which, which can throw light on the mechanisms of the disease pathogenesis. Yeah, thank, thank you. Yes, <clears throat> and somewhat, uh, distinguishing para-infectious from post-infectious, as you alluded to, is somewhat artifactual, um, unless you have clear evidence of an antibody that, that you, yeah. you think, rather than just a temporal association. But it can, it can be complicated, and, and it's challenging to do this sort of work in a setting where you can't test everyone for, for everything mm. one might want to do, had this been prospective. Um, Arena uh, has a question. I just wanted to ask one, if I may, beforehand. Given we have something as common as having COVID, and something relatively common as having GBS. How do you distinguish that this isn't just an epiphenomena and uh, in no way causal? Correct. I mean, I agree. I mean, uh, it is it's going to be difficult to uh, 
associated in that scenario unless we do have uh, uh, rt pcr positive uh, for sars coronavirus 2 in the csf which we did not find or any specific antibodies uh, which could be associated with the uh, the disease and gbs um, so it is difficult in that setting but um, you know the, the uh, you know when a patient comes with gbs and in those patients who also had an incidental covid 19 detected uh, how how would you I mean, the question we have is probably it is related you know when when two things are together or when the patients do present with covid 19 and gbs as well at the same time they have a covid 19 pneumonia and then the gbs that is where you are saying that it is probably uh, associated to the disease so the yeah. difficulty is there, uh, whether, uh, you know, it is an associated finding or it is just incidental, uh, as we talk about uh, CIDP and diabetes, that uh, it's, it's, yeah. it's going to be difficult to uh, differentiate. Yeah. Yes. And, and there's obviously a risk in applying the post hoc ergo propter hoc logic of one thing following one other thing, therefore being... Temporal called... association, basically. Yeah. Um, I suppose perhaps a control group would be, perhaps if, if one would doing this again, a control group of people with GBS not related to COVID and a control group of people with COVID with, without GBS might, might um, give some signal in that direction. Um, can, I, can I maybe add an, a small remark to this discussion? We yes. had an, a patient who had uh, GBS shortly after a an, uh, an, uh, 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 SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection. But when we did some further examinations, we've also found that this patient had a Campylobacter infection, uh, which can be asymptomatic. Um, so that is in a way I think that you could further research on is that if there are is not another explanation, uh, another preceding infection in your uh, cohort. So I agree with your recommendation to test for SARS-CoV-2 uh, in GBS case, but I would like to add also tests for the other preceding types of infections. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really important point, isn't it? Yeah. Um, th those pathogens where we know there's a very clear cut association, particularly. Um, thank you very much. There'll be time for a bit more discussion uh, later on, but it, we, we do need to move on to keep to time. So if I could ask uh, Hamilton uh, Morin to please share his screen and give us the JNNP uh, update, that would be great. So uh, Dr. Hamilton Morin, is, he's a psychiatry trainee uh, from King's College London, uh, who's been uh, working with the team uh, and with us on uh, neurology and neuropsychiatry of COVID. And thanks for the update. Over to you. Hi, thank you very much for having me speak here today. Uh, my name is Hamilton. Uh, as Ben mentioned, I'm a core trainee in psychiatry, uh, working with the Neuropsych COVID group on the blog. And today I'm just going to um, summarize some of the interesting papers to come out over the last month or so. And our first one is, in fact, um, quite a, an interesting and extensive meta-analysis by Ms. Reyes Howell from the World Health Organization Working Group, which evaluated the frequency of neurological manifestations from 350 studies, most of which were retrospective. Similar to our own group's meta-analysis, the majority of people evaluated were hospitalized with acute COVID-19, and most studies did look at acute nervous system manifestations. The most prevalent um, neurological manifestations were again in keeping with our findings that common things were common, and non-specific neurological symptoms uh, were most frequently reported, including fatigue, myalgia, um, ha headache, and specific to SARS-CoV-2, alter taste and smell. The authors also looked at prevalence of neurological diagnoses and found that stroke was the most common, prevalent in 2%. And echoing the existing literature, delirium was very common in the over 60s age group, with the presence of any neurological symptoms being associated with poor outcomes. Of course, this study really does make it clear that longer term outcomes of patients with acute neurological symptoms and complications are important to elucidate to adequately plan for service provision. And this is something currently being evaluated by the COVID CNS group. Now, looking at the, the most common symptom from our last study, fatigue, but instead of looking at it kind of more long term, uh, Rao et al conducted a meta analysis um, assessing fatigue symptoms in those who had recovered from initial COVID 19 illness. And pulling data from 41 studies, they found that post-COVID patients reported fatigue over three times more than healthy controls. And this was further stratified according to treatment settings, where it was found that half of individuals treated in hospital reported fatigue up to two months from discharge, 
as opposed to only 10% in those who didn't require hospitalization. Further analyses were conducted to determine if severity of COVID disease affected the prevalence of fatigue. However, the results were unequivocal. Of course, it's important to note that of these studies included, control groups only present in three studies, um, which reduces the power of comparison. And the majority of studies include relied on self-report as opposed to a validated measure. Um, that being said, these results are quite important in demonstrating burden of fatigue in this population. Now, our next study is from the um, FOSP COVID group, which is the post-hospitalization COVID-19 study, which is a long-term multi-center study of adults discharged from hospital in the UK with a diagnosis of COVID-19. In this publication from Evans et al., uh, they report on over a thousand patients with a median of six months post-discharge follow-up. In total, only 29% of participants reported full recovery at this point. And the most common symptoms at follow-up uh, were largely neuropsychiatric um, and neurological, including myalgia, fatigue, physical slowing down, impaired sleep, joint pain, limb weakness, and short-term memory loss. Interestingly, in just over a quarter of patients, clinically significant symptoms of anxiety and depression were noted, and there were PTSD symptoms noted in 12%. Interestingly, the study didn't find any relationship between disease severity and patient reported outcomes of mental health fatigue and cognitive impairment, which further supports the notion that severity of persistent physical and mental ill health and cognitive impairment may, may potentially be due to mechanisms other than those directly related to severity of acute lung injury in COVID-19. Now, coming on to our last, last study for the presentation. Uh, and it is a cross-sectional study by Saini et al, which compared 33 hospitalized patients with COVID-19 delirium um, to 43 with delirium from other courses, all of whom were referred to earlier as a psychiatry service. And it was found that delirium in COVID-19 patients was more commonly hypoactive in nature. And it was found that uh, COVID-19 delirium patients display significantly higher CRP inflammatory marker and significantly lower white cell count but there was no significant difference in PO2 or PCO2. Now the authors propose that these results may suggest an inflammatory basis for COVID-19 delirium rather than hypoxia. Um, of course, um, you know, from the relatively small sample size, as well as the, the nature of the study design being cross-sectional, um, making it hard to draw positive conclusions, it's clear that further research is required in this area before this can be concluded with any certainty. So that was a very quick whistle-stop tour of the recent literature, but I just want to thank you very much for listening. And if you have any interest in joining our international group, feel free to send an email to Tim's email address here. Thank you very much. That's super. Thank you, Hamilton, uh, for that update. That's great. That's always really refreshing to get these digests that uh, the team put together. And you've got a sparkly new website as well for it all now, which is all very exciting and, and searchable. So it's a really great... Thank you very much. Um, I could ask uh, Dr. Arena Tamborski if she might um, start sharing her screen to get ready. Uh, so Arena um, graduated in medicine from the University of Edinburgh, uh, and she's trained in neurology in uh, Liverpool and London. Uh, she's currently uh, in Liverpool um, on a prestigious NHR academic clinical fellowship, uh, working with us studying uh, different aspects of uh, COVID-19 uh, and its impact on the brain, along with uh, the COVID vaccines. Um, so. Uh, Arena, over to you. Thanks. Thank you very much for this introduction and uh, good afternoon and good morning and also good evening to our audience and thank you for plugging in today uh, for this webinar. Uh, so my name is Arina Tamborska and I am an academic clinical fellow in neurology, which means that I should be spending 75% of my time working clinically and 25% of my time working academically. Um, however, COVID times have been busy for all of us, which for me meant that I was spending 75% of my time working academically and also 75% working clinically, which means that this is why today I am able to present you the results of the UK-based surveillance study looking at the adverse events following COVID vaccinations. Um, so let's get started. And the focus today is, of course, Gideon-Barre syndrome. Uh, 
So this is just a brief slide uh, to summarize the UK uh, vaccination campaign for those in our audience who might not be familiar with the UK vaccination program. Uh, in this busy slide, there are three key points I wanted to highlight to you. First of all, is that there are three vaccines approved and rolled out for use in the UK. And this include the Pfizer vaccine, uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine, and the Moderna vaccine. And uh, you can see those at the top of the screen together with the rollout dates. The second point that I want you to take out of this slide is that people in the same age group were vaccinated at different times in the UK. And this is because we prioritize healthcare workers and social workers, and also young but clinically vulnerable individuals. And those were vaccinated at the same time as the older population. The last and the third point I want you to take away from this slide is that the key agency that looks at the uh, surveillance of adverse events following vaccinations in the UK is called MHRA, and this is a governmental agency, and they review and organize surveillance and then uh, issue guidance, which, for example, meant that in the UK we don't use the AstraZeneca vaccine in the population younger than 40. So it was MHRA that uh, initially reached out to us and asked us for help uh, with reviewing adverse uh, neurological events following COVID vaccinations. And uh, those are events of the special interest, uh, which are included on the right hand side of the slide. MHRA organizes surveillance via the yellow card reporting, which is a sort of very simple notification based system and um, that resembles uh, possibly maybe virus in the US. In in the USA, if any of you might be familiar with it. Uh, so it is a very simple form which basically says, um, I am so-and-so and I report an adverse event of this and this nature, so-and-so many days after this and that vaccination. Uh, so it is a simply a, ma a matter of notification. Obviously, uh, to confirm the nature of the event, one needs more detailed information. And that's why we came in and uh, at an expense of one Christmas break about a year ago, we um, produced and delivered um, sort of complex follow up forms, which ask for more clinical information and are visible as a screenshot here at the bottom of the screen. Anyone can submit a yellow card report. And very soon we've noted that to actually reach out to those who will be most aware of the cases, we need to reach to neurologists in the UK. And this is because a yellow card report is submitted often very early on in the disease course. And this is often before actually um, a specific neurological diagnosis is confirmed because some of those neurological diagnoses are difficult to make. That's why we approach Association of British Neurologists and via their website, we set out a notification system. Uh, and in that way, we received notifications from both yellow card system and also from neurologists. And uh, everyone who submitted a notification will be asked to complete a more detailed clinical form. In this way, out of the list of um, events of interest that I showed on the previous slide, we pick out two that were particularly significant. One of them was vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia, and neurological manifestation of that was cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, and we published a detailed description of these cases in Lancet uh, earlier this year. However, as the cases were um, uh, um, induced uh, vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia uh, were taking our attention. We've also noted that Guillain-Barre syndrome uh, and its variants were slowly coming in through the system and increasing. So what we did with those cases when we, once we received a detailed clinical assessment form? Well, first of all, we wanted to confirm that the case is truly a GPS case. Then second, we wanted to assess for causality, which is actually something that just came up in our GBS discussion uh, regarding the COVID infection. Uh, and third, we wanted to report collectively once all these cases were assessed independently by two clinicians. And we wanted to look at their clinical features, the demographics, outcomes, and compare those to previously published large GBS cohort from the IGOS study. So um, development of this uh, mechanism and this pathway was an important part of the study as much as were the results. So I'm just gonna spend a second uh, talking through uh, how we assess the cases. Uh, so for ascertainment of the diagnosis, we wanted to use Brighton criteria, which are internationally validated and approved and frequently used uh, for the diagnosis of GBS, particularly in the context of uh, vaccination surveillance. The most common variant of GBS is classing sensory motor variant. And GBS can affect any peripheral nerve, and that would lead to weakness and sensory dysfunction in the limbs. It can also affect the face and also lead to respiratory problems, uh, and uh, patients may require invasive ventilation. Which is why the definition of GBS focuses in particular on weakness of the limbs, as you can see in the case definition table here. <laughs> 
Uh, this is good and that works for most variants of GBS. However, there will be some variants for which this definition would be applicable. And we've noted that those variants, in particular the bilateral uh, facial policy with paresthesias, were coming in through our surveillance study. Uh, and so we had to modify the, those criteria to make sure that we pick up those variants and include them and do not miss uh, wrongly any true cases of GBS. To assess for causality, we wanted to use the WHO criteria. Um, however, WHO, I don't think they anticipated the pandemic coming in with new vaccinations coming out uh, because uh, their algorithm basically asks um, in the assessment whether there is any established evidence that this particular vaccine, when given correctly, can cause this adverse event. And obviously for new vaccinations, we are creating new knowledge. We are just learning about those things. Uh, so really using this algorithm, every single case will be judged as indeterminate. That's why we developed our own criteria on the right side of the screen. And uh, here we looked at the timeline from the vaccination, as well as presence of any alternative etiologies, uh, such as infections, which are particularly important for GPS. So now uh, quickly onto the results. Uh, between um, the beginning of our surveillance and up to the end of June this year, we verified and confirmed 70 cases of GPS which were notified to us from uh, by neurologists and neurophysiologists via the Association um, of British Neurologists in the UK. Uh, and uh, really a few things were um, sort of jumping out at us and quite starking really. Uh, we've noted that uh, 67 of those cases were following Chadax-1 vaccine, which is the AstraZeneca vaccine, and most of them were after the first dose. Uh, in comparison, if you look at the numbers of people vaccinated in the UK, uh, about 50% per more, 50% uh, more of people received Chadox-1 vaccine uh, as opposed to the Pfizer vaccine. But of course, that proportion wasn't quite the proportion we saw in our cohort of uh, GBS after vaccination. We also carried out a causality assessment. And here we noted that all cases where there was no alternative etiology and the timelines were fitting with the vaccination as a possible cause were actually cases after the AstraZeneca vaccine. And the Pfizer vaccine were only three cases which were grouped as either possible or unlikely. So really the question at this point is whether we can draw a conclusion and say, uh, well, is, is that it? Do we see an association? And of course, things are never that simple uh, because you could calculate expected rates of how many uh, GBS cases would you see in a such number of population who received a given vaccine just by chance. But the problem is that you don't, you cannot only know how many people received each vaccine. You also need to know how old these patients were. And this is data from uh, the UK health episode statistics, which we pulled for the purpose of this study. And here the orange line is the instance of cases of GBS in the UK in male population. And you can clearly see that as the population gets older, uh, the, GBS, the risk of GBS increases. And this is important because, as I showed on my previous slide, on the slide number one, uh, people um, in different age groups got different vaccines. And for example, we don't vaccinate the young population with AstraZeneca anymore. So what could we do instead? Well, we looked at the distribution of the age groups um, in our cohort and that and also compared that with the distribution we would expect should we take a random sample of 67 GBS cases um, which were not vaccine related. So what we observed is that um, in, if we took 67 patients in whom GBS wouldn't be vaccine related, most of the cases would be seen in the sort of older um, age groups. However, in our case, we saw uh, that uh, most cases were actually in the middle age population. So really what we needed now was an epidemiological study which could answer the most important question, which is, is the AstraZeneca vaccine associated with GBS? Before I uh, jump into epidemiology, just a quick word about the clinical features because this was really interesting. Um, although most of our patients in the study, about 80%, uh, developed a classic sensory motor variant of GBS, which was demyelinating, um, we did note an increased proportion of patients with this rare variant of uh, facial diplegia with paresthesias, which is why it's very important that we included those in the study. Um, also importantly, we've noted that fewer patients reported previous infection before their GBS, and we compared that with the IGOS study, which is a large uh, GBS cohort, and that difference was significant. Uh, crucially, there was no difference in severity, outcomes, or mortality.
So now just the last slide about epidemiology, because this is really what answers our question. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago in Nature Medicine, we've had a large uh, study uh, published from Oxford, which was a self-controlled case series, which is where every participant has uh, access to control to themselves. So this is really good to adjust for inherent biases. Uh, what this study showed is that there was no link to the mRNA vaccines and GPS. However, the risk of GPS was increased uh, from 15 days onwards following the um, AstraZeneca vaccine. However, this risk was much higher following the COVID infection itself. And as of the 21st of October, in the UK, the product information for a COVID AstraZeneca vaccine was modified to include the GPS. So just very briefly take home messages. Uh, first of all, GPS is a very, very adverse event of the um, COVID AstraZeneca vaccine, and most cases would probably follow the first dose. We saw them on a median time, about 14 days. However, outcomes are good, and mRNA vaccines uh, in particular do not carry an increased risk. The second point is that we should be aware of the rare, uh, meaning that we did see a higher proportion of an atypical variant, and um, about 27% of our sample, which were clinically very much GPS, did not, did not beat Brighton criteria. And this is important because if someone followed the Brighton criteria only, uh, they would not classify those cases. And uh, that's why surveillance systems do need clinicians to look at the cases carefully. Uh, thirdly, uh, there are lots of studies cropping up when people compare expected versus observed rates of adverse events. Uh, however, what you need to ask yourself is, do they adjust for age? Do they adjust for other confounders? And self-controlled case series are the best um, probably system or a study designed to do that. And fourthly, and lastly, uh, the risk of GPS is greater with the COVID infection itself. So the most important message is do get vaccinated. Um, thank you very much. That was a very quick run through of a long, um, year long uh, project. I just wanted to highlight all the clinicians that contributed to the study, including the amazing co authors and the study group, and also doctors who looked after those patients while simultaneously uh, filling in our rather lengthy clinical information record. So, thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Arena. Again, I should give, applause you on behalf of our silent audience. That was a great presentation, and uh, I know quite how much work that was. Uh, to, to deliver that. So it's, it's a real, uh, real achievement. Um, do any of the panel have any questions for Arena? Uh, if not, then there is one in the Q&A. Um, I think maybe my question is also a bit the question that's in the Q&A, because I think one of the, um, by the way, great presentation and fantastic work, but um, of course, the question is why the AstraZeneca vaccine and not the other um, uh, vaccines that we have for COVID. Do, do you have an idea why this is? This is this is actually a really interesting question, uh, and uh, I think. Um, in general, it's not only the AstraZeneca, a similar information and uh, product um, warning has been also introduced for Janssen vaccine in the US, which I didn't cover because we don't use it in the UK. So um, it looks like we might be looking at adenovirus-based vaccines in general. Uh, the question why they are causing such an immune response uh, is uh, frankly speaking, I don't know, but there are a couple of good reviews coming up uh, on how those vaccines might trigger um, an immune response. And I think probably we'll learn the most on this, looking at the vaccine induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia cases, uh, where people have closely studied this and looked at the sort of immune cascades that are activated by the vaccine in selected individuals. Um, the next step here, obviously, would be to inquire whether we can recruit our GPS cohort uh, into a study, like for example, COVID CNS, to look in particular what caused those individuals to be affected. Uh, so I think in brief, you know, I'm, I'm sort of avoiding, but I think, you know, it's a complex answer. It's a complex process. It looks to be related to adenovirus vaccines in general. And I think uh, we definitely need more sort of uh, base, um, baseline um, studies to look at that. Maybe I can, can ask you a question as well. So first of all, Arena, thank you for this uh, wonderful presentation. Very clear uh, results. Um, Still, I was wondering, you have probably also seen the study uh, by Keddy et al, uh, published in Brain, uh, also from, uh, from the UK. That was also mentioned by uh, Dr. Dan in her presentation, and they find no association. Um, can you explain their results when you compare them to your results or to the results recently published in, uh, in Nature Medicine, also from the UK? Yes, I've been thinking about this study for uh, quite a long time because this is, as you say, a well-known study frequently cited that shows no association. 
Um, I think when you read that study closely, it's well, very well designed, but what they essentially show uh, is that there were no more cases of GPS during the pandemic, rather than GPS is not associated with COVID infection itself, because it wasn't a case control designed. And um, we know from other studies elsewhere that actually the incidence of GPS is lower during the pandemic. And we know that GPS is an infection triggered event in sort of the classical form. So we know that people frequently in Europe would have a pre-existing respiratory infection or a gastrointestinal infection elsewhere in the world. And um, the question really is, is whether with um, increased um, uh, sanitary measures, social distancing measures, hand hygiene, whether we manage to sort of decrease the natural rate of GPS so low down uh, that actually the cases associated with COVID infections, they do not spike up. And that's why they didn't, they didn't pick it up in the uh, CADI study in brain that you refer to. However, I think, you know, um, case control, self-controlled case series, which is probably the base study designed to adjust for all the biases, uh, shows more clearly that possibly there is an association. So I think I would lean towards um, our, our sort of uh, thinking here that yes, GBS is associated with COVID infections and COVID vaccinations as well as we know now. And can I ask one more question about the, the because the, in the study um, of um, in what's in Nature Medicine uh, published, uh, they say, as you mentioned, well, there, there's a higher risk when you compare the COVID cases to the COVID vaccine cases, right, for, for AstraZeneca. But I think these are the cases that have had the vaccine and also have had the infection. Or do they compare the infection to the vaccine? So, uh, this, yeah, because otherwise you would be confounding. But the study is designed in a way that it looks at separate time periods. So it looks at the individuals um, who are before the vaccines, but got COVID actually. Um, so um, the data I think is a clear split actually in, in that study, so, so it's quite well designed. Okay. Yes, I, I think we certainly in, in the UK, we, I, I think it's fair to say we've seen a reduction in, of all infections uh, through social distancing, mask wearing, hand washing, the kids not being in school particularly, because as we all know, they're little Petri dishes of, uh, of bugs. Um, so, uh, Rena, um, I just wanted to ask a, a quick question, if I may. Um, do do you have any way that you could compare hospital episode statistics to, for dis so discharge coding to the specific cases that you have picked up through the surveillance study in a sort of capture recapture uh, analysis approach to see if you can get a better handle on what the actual incidence is? Because obviously, it's reporting bias and coding bias to account for. Mm, so you're asking if the cases we identified, whether we could confirm uh, that those were coded correctly, essentially, in the hospital episode statistics. Is that roughly what, what, what yes. the question is? Yeah. yeah, I think you would need to go back, um, you know, to the clinicians and, and essentially check the patient's records um, and then go back to the uh, HES database. In terms of how that's coded on the individual level, I am not sure because we didn't require to sort of look at individual patient record uh, in this study um, we looked we sort of took a generalized approach of extracting the HES data which was particularly coded as GBS uh, but I do know that there are studies that do validate the codes used in HES um, and and that they seem to be matching with the with the GBS um, diagnosis another thing is that the HES database is delayed so we couldn't really rely on that on confirming the association with the vaccine because time is required to get everything coded so it's a few months behind as far as I knew yeah so maybe something for the future um, and, and something that's also for the future, people keep mentioning COVID CNS, so just very, very briefly, this is the COVID clinical neuroscience study that I co-lead um, with Jerome Breen, we're recruiting 800 patients with COVID infection and vaccine related neurological complications and 500 uh, controls, and they're all getting an immunological workup, st structural and functional neuroimaging. Um, and GWAS, et cetera, to try and get at some of these mechanistic questions, which have been at the heart of lots of the discussion today. Can I just have one question for Dr. Arina? Sure. Sorry, I mean, I was just like... No problem. Yeah, so Arina, amongst your uh, post-COVID vaccine GBS cases, did you have any um, uh, severe GBS cases uh, who did not recover? Uh, because recently, you know, there was a medical student here in India uh, who received the COVID shield uh, similar to AstraZeneca vaccine. And uh, within two weeks of the COVID shield, uh, this has been eight months now, uh, it's severe GBS, uh, it's an axonal GBS, uh, 
he's just just bed bound quadriplegic quadriplegia mm-hmm. he's on a ventilator still uh, for about 6 6 months he was on a ventilator we've been able to uh, take him off the ventilator now and he's on a tracheostomy so did you see any severe cases um, in your cohort Uh, that's yeah that's a very sad story uh, and yes uh, i did see one case in the whole cohort of 70 of someone who did not have uh, an improvement or any recovery and remained uh, ventilator dependent at um, over three months actually from the from the incident um, but overall um, most people were recovering well at the end of yeah. the study so i think um, you know there are always odd cases but overall picture was um, similar to sort of classical gps with recovery uh, later on in later stages yeah that's great and yeah. um, that so so a tragic case to, to hear about of course um but that i i will just conclude then by saying these are exactly the sorts of cases and discussions which are perfect for our who clinical exchange platform um so the next will be on the 30th of november they're really interactive there's lots of breakout groups we break up by who region so we can learn a lot about what people are seeing uh, as well not just in our own countries but around the world um so a last thanks to you all thanks to our speakers and panelists and thanks to all you all for joining us and we'll see you next time